A bird's life in Wales must seem the most pleasant existence you could ever wish for. What could possibly be better than being on a perch, singing happily all day, without a worry in the world? And, of course, there's that ability to fly. To go anywhere you feel like, totally free. A life made in heaven. Anything but. Birds have to work from dawn until dusk. They have to find food and water to live. If they fail to do so, they die. They have to battle the elements. Survival, especially during winter, is extremely difficult. During spring, they're busy raising new families. Then, they not only have to feed themselves, but also their hungry chicks. They have to protect the chicks from others who wish to do them harm. And they can be targets themselves. And, of course, they have to put up with us to find a way of surviving in our artificial landscape. In this series, I'm going to be finding out what a bird's life is really like in Wales. I'm going to be discovering the vast array of species we have here, and I'm going to be probing into their secret lives. The uplands of Traith Mawr in the Brecon Beacons. Dawn's breaking on a cold April morning. The beacon's highest peak, Penavan, is in the distance. This first hour is alive with sounds. The day starts early for birds. As the sun rises and the mist lifts, the birds are revealed in all their glory. In this program, I'm exploring the secret life of bird calls. Can't be that many places left in the whole of Wales, I don't think now, where you've got a fairly unspoilt area like this with an incredible variety of habitats in it. You've got the tall grassland here, you've got the gorse, you've got the hills behind me, you've got marshland, you've got bracken covered hills over there as well. And you've got so many birds here. And you can identify all of them from their calls and their songs as well. This is a dunnock. A willow wobbler. and a sedge warbler. These are all male birds and they're singing to mark their territory. And in their territory they've chosen the highest perch on the tallest bush to sing. Is this scratchy kind of call here amongst the ghosts? That's a sedge warbler just in from Africa now. There are skylax in this grass that are made up a bit. There's even a pair of curlew over there. So a willow warbler going away now. 
There's been a cuckoo calling from that hillside over there. But the best one, I think, of all is in this marshy, wet area here. It's a bird called a snipe. And it has got a call. It's got a kind of a, a tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock kind of call. But it also does a display where it doesn't use its beak. It actually uses its tail. It pushes out these two outer tail feathers. And when it dives down, it does just this most incredible, incredible noise. This is the snipe's tic-tac call. The snipe is calling somewhere on the ground. It's loud enough to attract a female into its territory. And then he displays. The movement of wind through his outer tail feathers creates a unique noise. This is Butte Park, Cardiff. Here too, it's an early start for the birds. This is a song thrush, one of our finest singers. It'll always repeat a phrase at least twice. It's important to sing early to be the first one to attract the attention of a female. Also, his sound will travel further in the park in the relative silence of the dawn than it will do later on in the day. A lot of our birds actually start singing in the middle of winter. And that's a good thing because there are no leaves and you can see them. And one of the earliest and the smallest is the wren. This one singing away in here now. It's one of our smallest birds. And yet, it has an incredibly loud song. I think it's all lungs. Because it doesn't burst into song. It absolutely explodes. And this one is waggling its wings like this. He's got a rival somewhere nearby and he's trying to make himself look just that little bit bigger. I cracking birds, I like wrens. Teacher, 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 can you hear that? That's a great tit. There's one up here, and there's another one answering from over there somewhere. I, it's, it's a common bird, a really common garden and woodland bird. And yet you look at it close up, and it's, it's stunning. Greens and yellows and blacks and whites. And the song is interesting. And they found that the males with the longest and most intricate songs are the most successful at attracting a mate. So what they do is they'll steal little bits of other birds' songs and incorporate it into their own. But they've always got that teacher, teacher, teacher element into it. There are lots of them here. Great spotted woodpeckers too were attracting each other. They have a different method. They drum. This is a female. Both males and females drum. The male has a red patch on his neck. And like all good drummers, they select the best drum. The one that will make the most noise. Thank you. 
Although bird songs can be complex and varied within species, some birds make do with a very simple one. This little bird is singing above Cabor Bay near Cardigan on the North Pembrokeshire coast. You know, when we think of birdsong, we tend to think of really tuneful songs, like the melodious songs of robins and blackbirds, or maybe even a skylark. But not all birds sing like that. This is a white throat. It's a little warbler that just come all the way back from Africa, and he keeps singing from this song post that he's got here. In this case, it's an old bit of bramble. And his song is what you could call, at best, a scratchy song. But it obviously works, because he's got a female nesting just over the bank here. There he goes. He's probably going to go off to, to feed her for a while before he comes back again and sings from exactly the same post. This lucky whitethroat probably has one of the best patches of territory in Wales. A summer residence with outstanding views. Some birds are not so lucky, even very special birds. This is a Dartford warbler. It's one of Wales's rarest birds. And his residence overlooks Port Talbot. The Dartford warbler looks quite different to any other small bird that you'll see in Wales. The view doesn't matter. What's more important is that he's found a small patch of perfect habitat where he can sing and nest. But he'll have to sing very loud above the traffic noise, and this is something all urban birds have to get used to. This is Betus Akoid in North Wales. It's early morning and the A5 is very busy. In the park, birds are also getting on with their busy lives. Song thrush singing away up there, singing its little heart out from the top of that tree. And it'll do that all through the spring and into the summer. The problem is, it's decided to nest in a town, and so it's going to compete every morning with the traffic. Research has shown that urban birds may make their songs louder to compensate for this noise. The songs can also be very different to the songs of the same species living in the countryside. Not all birds sing from a perch. Some Welsh birds live in habitats where there are no trees or suitable perches to sing from. These are the Gronant sand dunes near Prestatyn in North Wales. Here, skylarks breed during the spring and summer. I don't think many songs can compete with the songs of the skylark. It's a busy time for them now. It's very early spring, and the males are just setting up territories. You see them every now and again chasing each other around, but more than anything else, they'll sing and they'll climb and climb and climb and sing and sing and sing. And it's like a, like a competition for them. See which one can do the most complicated song and climb the highest. And it's important that they do that because the territory that they establish now has got to sustain not just them, but a mate and a family as well. 
That's why you'll get them, lots of them, not just this one, but there are dozens of them here singing away all the way through spring into summer, almost into the autumn as well. It's a lovely sound. Skylarks have incorporated their song into an aerial display. The males attract the females by literally falling from the sky. And they'll do it over and over again, even when a female has been found, to keep her and keep the territory. Ever since I was a little lad, I've been fascinated by birds' nests and looking for them. And a wall like this now is ideal for a robin or a wren, maybe. But because they tuck the nests away so well, one of the best ways to find them is to listen. Listen out for an alarm call. Now, alarm call is different for every bird, but they're quite similar in a way, too, because they're very loud, very harsh, often very staccato, a bit like a machine gun. And when you hear that, you know the nest isn't far away. And the alarm call serves several purposes. First of all, it's to ward me away, to warn me, oi, stay back. Also, it's to warn other birds around that there is danger in the area. But as much as anything else, it's also to warn the mate who will be incubating eggs or young to stay quiet, to stay still and not to give away the location of the nest. We've all heard this one, an unhappy blackbird. It's usually a cat or a person walking under his tree. It's illegal to go anywhere near a peregrine's nest because it's a protected species. But the peregrine would soon let you know if you were too near. Now this is an interesting situation in a woodland near Harlech. A nuthatch pair has taken up residence in an old woodpecker hole. The nuthatch at the nest is alerted by an alarm call from his mate. A woodpecker is now an unwelcome guest when he ventures too close to the nest. The nuthatch pair do their very best to scare him off. Eventually, the woodpecker gets the message. This chaffinch has a nest nearby. It's making a high-pitched alarm call. It's very high frequency and very difficult for us to make out. But it's meant for its chicks. A sign for them to be quiet and not to give away the nest's location. All of these calls are an early warning system and are essential in helping birds escape danger. Some birds have calls that are so complicated, it's as if they have their own language. This is Newborough Forest on the west coast of Anglesey. It's one of the largest conifer plantations in Wales. During winter, around 800 ravens roost every night in the forest. It's one of the biggest assemblages of ravens in Britain. Ravens have the widest range of calls of any bird.
During the day, they scavenge the land for food and return here at dusk to the security and relative warmth of the forest. As they arrive and occupy roosting positions in the trees, the calls they make to each other are fascinating. There must be a reason why ravens are calling like this. They're not simply calling for fun. For the time being, it's a mystery. We don't understand their language. But there's good evidence that they may be sharing information about food sources. A raven cannot defend a carcass on its own, but it can if it's part of a group. thought that the volume and nature of a call may be giving information about the location, distance and size of a find. By sharing this information, they can all go back together the next day to benefit from the food. All over Wales, fabulous views of flying flocks are common, especially along the coast. And in these flocks, birds often call to each other. These waders are near the Menai Straits. It's a place you'll hear a fabulous range of calls. Canada geese are taking off on the Nevin estuary in Pembrokeshire. Jackdaws are particularly noisy. These are returning to roost near Llanelli. But the most impressive communication show you'll experience in Wales, both in terms of sound and vision, is that performed by starlings. These have arrived at Aberystwyth to spend the night on the pier. Oh, sky here now. It's just full of starlings, back and forth and back and forth. And watching them coming into roost is really hypnotic. It's huge shape that's constantly changing all the time. And the advantage with Aberystwyth Pier is that it's so short and that means that they'll display right over your head. And also, you can hear them, thousands of wings. If you listen carefully, all these wings beating at once and they call to each other constantly as well. And because you're so close to the whole spectacle here, you feel that you're part of it. Here they go again, look at that. Like a wave of starlings coming over. Oh, wow. By dusk, thousands arrive, maybe 20,000 or more. No one really knows for sure why starlings do this, but they're certainly communicating with each other for some reason. They're constantly calling. The flying display itself may serve a social need. 
They might be organising themselves into the strongest and fittest, who will eventually get the best roosting position. They might be moving around to protect themselves from predatory birds. They could simply be checking out the roost before they land. Whatever the reason, it's an impressive sight. And they continue to call and chatter after landing. By the time every bird has found a perch, there's hardly a single position free. Huddled together, they keep warm. And the birds at the centre of the roost will not only be warmer, but safer too. No fox, cat or peregrine can get at them here. It's first light on Druabon Mountain near Llangollen in North East Wales. Dawn, literally, is stirring. Strange noises can be heard for miles across the barren moor. The sounds are made by male black grouse. They're displaying. A contest is taking place. The winner will be the top bird of this patch of moor. He will be the best and fittest grouse. The one that'll have the pick of the females. To win the contest, however, making a big noise will not be enough. The best grouse will also have to look good. These birds have made themselves big and colourful. Their body feathers have a beautiful sheen. The tail has transformed to a bright white fan. The red head pats or wattles are normally a quarter of this size. They've been engorged by blood to make them more visible. And all this massive visual and vocal effort is for one thing and one thing only. To earn the right to mate with a female. And for this male, all the effort has paid off. need for males to attract females has led to the huge variety of beautiful birds we have in Wales. Lapwings with headdresses, goldfinches with multicoloured jackets, wagtails with bright coloured waistcoats, colourfully adorned pheasants, Male birds often change their colour from winter to spring. This is the winter version of a black-headed gull. And this is the summer version. Starlings change their beak colour and develop a very glossy coat. Little grebes also grow colourful feathers for the spring. They all do this to court females. That will be my next Secret Life of Birds. Yeah.